figure out what's going on. If you have a productive conversation with someone, that's what you're doing. You know, you say, well, let's see if we can figure out how to get along. Maybe this is within the confines of an intimate relationship. It's like, okay, what do you want? What do I want? How is that going to fit together? Can we communicate honestly about exactly what that is and how we might get it? And it's a, it's a process of co-discovery. It's not like you know the answer to begin with. And you're not going to find it unless you tell each other the truth. And you're not going to be able to pursue it unless you act out the truth that you articulate. And I don't think you're going to be able to articulate the truth properly unless what you want is the good. And that's a very difficult thing to figure out. But I think one of the things we do know after the 20th century that the continual attempt to make the world as atrocious a place as possible seems to be searching in the wrong direction. Now, you know, I've tried this sort of thing for a very long period of time because I think that what I try to do or I, what I try to do is to say what I believe to be the, the case in every situation that I'm in and to see what happens. And my experience has been that really works. Like it really works. You can learn to get along with the people in your family and help them straighten out and you can start to have a relatively beneficial effect on processes that are outside of your, you know, of what's right in front of you and within your grasp. So you can practice trying to figure out how to set things straight. And I have no idea what the ultimate limits of that might be. But I can tell you one thing, it certainly makes your life ridiculously interesting. And, you know, that in itself is one of the things that takes away the sting of mortality. Because if what you're doing is so damn interesting, you can hardly stand it. The fact that you have to pay a price as you move along starts to become acceptable. You know, because you'll pay a price if it's worth it. It's Nietzsche said, if you have a why, you can bear any how. And I think there's some truth in that. And, you know, you might say, well, what's, what's a good that's sufficiently good to justify voluntarily participating in being that's bent on your misery and destruction? And that's the fundamental question of life. Well, I would say you need a pretty elevated vision in order to counteract that. And I think that's what a vision of paradise is. And I think that paradise is something that people have to build. I think if we built it properly, it would justify everything that happened on the way to building it. Or at least that might be the case. And I think you can do it locally first. So, and I can't see, and I've watched people, I've watched how people have lived, lived now for decades. And I have two clients in my practice right now who, who've, one of them was pretty damn straight to begin with, but he's set up his, his business, it happens to be a firm, and he's tried to make absolutely straight decisions that were really informed and proper the entire way along. And the bloody thing is running like a, like a, it's running, it's equilibrated. It's extremely effective. It's not wasteful. Everybody who's inside the organization is developing properly. Um, no one's getting screwed over. Like it's, it's an honest and straightforward enterprise and everybody seems to be benefiting from it. And I have another, client who was pretty damn confused and arrogant and resentful when he first started changing his life and he put together a relatively small business and I would say it's a low status business but he's done it as honestly as he possibly could and he tried to keep himself on the straight and narrow while he's doing it and he's tried to give his customers outstanding service and to be clear and straight with them at every single choice moment and that's lifted his cynicism and it's made his business very, very productive and, and positive. Like you said that all the data shows that one of the best things you can do in your life to maximize your long-term health and increase your probability of at least some joy is to have a functional long-term intimate relationship. And so you have to attend to that. And a huge part of that is the development of these shared visions. And it's really useful to, to develop micro visions. And so my first response is, well, how often do you want to have? And people hate <laughs> that. People hate that question, and so they avoid it. They say, "Well, you know, we don't really want to be that calculating about it." It's like, okay, right, whatever. We're going to parameterize <laughs> this once a year. It's like, no, that's probably <laughs> too little. Okay, fifteen right. times a day. It's like, no, that's probably too much. Okay, so now we got some parameters here. It's somewhere between once a year and 15 times a day. Let's see if we can narrow that in. And this does make people uncomfortable, right? They don't want to specify their needs and wants. 
And I think it's what's, partly, this, what's the source of that discomfort? What, where does that well, come from? I think they're embarrassed that they need anything. Right? Ah, so it's just fundamental shame. Like it's that same exposure of nakedness. And then they're they're unwilling to share the information with their partner because it's revealing. And then they're afraid they're going to be rebuffed. And they're afraid they're going to get into a fight. They've got lots of reasons not to want to do it. But the and that point, rolls back to those stories that, yeah. been ch- that have been haunting them since they were kids, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and they don't want to have the difficult conversation up front. And so we might say, well, okay, let's, let's be reasonable about this. It's going to be some number of times a week. You guys have jobs. You have kids. You're busy. You're not going to have a hot date every night. You just don't have time for it. And so why don't we be reasonable about it? We could try, let's aim for something like twice a week. It's like, can you think... Or maybe we could start with once a week. Because zero once is a lot more than zero. It's a lot more than zero. (laughs) And so then you think, well, all right. And then they say something like, well, you know, we did all that dating when we were dating and and now we don't want to do that anymore. It's like, okay, so what are you saying here exactly? You're saying that you don't want any more romance and you don't want any more hot sex and you don't want to put any work into it. And it's just going to happen magically, even though it's clearly not happening. That's that's your theory. And then let's let's run that theory out. Okay, so now you have new kids, and that's going to be it's going to be like that for a few years, maybe till they're ten or eleven. You're going to be occupied with your family, and so now you have a sexless marriage with no intimacy for a decade. So what does that look like in like 2032 when you're in divorce court? It's because it requires difficult negotiation, but. How would you like to have your marriage deteriorate into hell over a 10-year period? How does that sound as an alternative? It's like, well, that's not very good. It's like, okay, so which of these two things are you more afraid of? And then the when people really think that through, they think, oh, yeah, well, maybe, you know, I could take the risk of making what I want known. And then, okay, so now you specify it. Well, a date. Which night? How long? How, are you going to find a babysitter? Are you going to do this every week? Who's going to be responsible for what in relationship to this date? All these details have to be negotiated. And then we remember, you know, by the same logic that we've already employed, if this is two hours a week, then that's 15% of one day. That's another 5% of your life. And it's the intimate part of your life. And if you got that right, my God, you might be a much happier person. And so that's another one of the only 25 things you have to take care of to set your life up. But I mean, you said, why are people afraid to do this? Is they're, they're afraid to show their vulnerability. Man, they don't trust their partner. They don't know how to negotiate. They don't even know what they want themselves. You know, like, it's not that easy for someone to admit that they need any physical attention at all, even though everyone obviously does. You know, because you're putting yourself on the line then. And that is the definition of intimacy in some sense.